Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day you've made and we rejoice in it. Lord, today we're going to look at the prophet Joel and see what he has to tell us and how it might relate to us today in our world, in our time, in our circumstances. And so we ask you, Lord, to anoint my tongue to declare this word this morning and anoint every ear to hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The prophet Joel. The first verse says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pithuel. Our first question, of course, is, Who is Joel, the son of Pithuel? Well, the first thing we can know is the fact that his name Joel, Joel, means the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Beyond that, we actually don't know much else about who this Joel is. We also do not know when he served the Lord as prophet. The normal identifying markers to let us know, you know, when a person was serving the Lord as prophet, they just aren't there. We aren't told what kings, you know, were ruling at the time, either in Judah or in Israel. Uh, and so we just don't know. It appears, it appears that he may have been ministering before the prophet Amos. And the reason why commentators have come to this conclusion is the fact that Amos quotes Joel in a number of places. Quotes the phraseology perfectly. So that's why they think he may have, you know, been borrowing from Joel. Of course, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could just have given Amos the same words. Okay, we've got to keep that in mind too. Though the identity of Joel is a mystery, though we do not know when he served the Lord as prophet, his message is clear. The word he declares comes after an unprecedented time of trouble that had come upon the land. Listen to what the Lord says through his prophet. He declares, hear this, you elders... And give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? You know, what's being said here? He, said, he, he identifies first the elders. You old guys. You old guys. All your older people and everyone else. Think back as far as you can. Consider even all of the stories your fathers told you. And, and ask this question, has a calamity such as the one that you have just experienced, the one that you've just gone through, has it ever been experienced in the land before? Apparently it had not been. Or the question wouldn't have been asked in the first place. Now, certainly God had uh, rained terrible trouble and devastation down on Egypt, many, 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 many years ago, but that was long before these people were born, okay? They would have known about that devastation in Egypt because it was written down for them in the Torah by Moses. It is, however, quite a different thing to experience a devastation such as this locust swarm uh, than it is just to read about it. Nothing could have prepared them for the trouble they were going through, and what they were going through was not ever supposed to ever be forgotten. Because the Lord, through Joel, says, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. If you count the number of generations spoken of here, it's five. First, the elders are supposed to think about what their fathers had told them. So you get the fathers and the elders tell their children, their children, and their children. So there's five generations. The Lord did not want this to be forgotten. What is the calamity? Locusts. We read in verse 4, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now commentators disagree on what is meant by the terms chewing locust, swarming locust, crawling locust, and consuming locust. The Hebrew word for each one is different. 
but they do not believe that different species are being spoken of here. What is likely being meant by the chewing and the swarming and the crawling and the whatever is what is likely being meant, uh, meant here are the different stages of the locust development. Okay? Certainly all locusts chew, all locusts consume, but they don't all fly until their wings are developed. Only then can they gather together in swarms. I want to show you a brief video on locusts. That way we can better visualize the problem, okay? There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers, for at this stage they're flightless. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. But when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the fast track. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. locust eats its entire body weight every day and a whole swarm can consume literally hundreds of tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The swarm travels with the wind. It's the most energy saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form gigantic plagues several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. They will consume every edible thing that lies in their path. This is one of planet Earth's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen on this scale, and it won't last long. Once the food has gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert wind. Can you imagine a locust swarm that's 40 miles wide? You know, it's hard to imagine. But apparently this was the type, or maybe even something bigger, that had come upon the land that uh, God had given to his people. But why had this trouble come upon the land? Well, there would only be one reason for it. Sin. Sin and rebellion. Uh, sin and rebellion against the Lord, not heeding words of warning before the trouble came so that the trouble could be averted through repentance. Um... Eventually, though, the Lord has to act. Sin has its consequences. So, uh, the prophet Joel, he doesn't actually identify what the sin is. But we have the words from Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, we get uh, blessings for...
following the word of the Lord and curses for not following the word of the Lord. Let me uh, spell out um, a few of those curses. This is from Deuteronomy 28, selected verses, beginning at verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in, for the locusts shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither, neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. And you shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for the olives will drop off. Locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land. In the prophet, in the prophecies of Joel, locusts had come upon the land, and the prophet was given a word from the Lord to declare to his people. It's interesting, he starts, the Lord starts with what we might consider an unlikely group of people to begin your declaration. He starts with the drunkards. Okay, we read in verse 5, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. There's not going to be any wine for you to drink anymore. There you go. Weep and wail, guys. For a nation has come up against my land strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. The drunkards are told to weep and to wail. You know, interesting, as I've said, the new wine has been cut off. There's not going to be anything for them to drink. The nation spoken of in verse 8, that too is referenced to locusts. Okay, that too is referenced to locusts. They move, as we saw in the video, an unstoppable army. Okay, their weapon is not conventional. Their weapon is their teeth. The weapon that they use are their teeth. With their teeth, they consume everything in their path. Through the prophet, the Lord declares that his vine, his fig tree, is ruined and stripped bare. The words vine and fig tree... Those two words are biblical references to God's people. You know, God God does not take delight in bringing such trouble upon his people. But what is he supposed to do? Sin has consequences. And sometimes the consequences are severe. And generally speaking, the more you ignore the warnings of God, the more severe the trouble is going to be when it finally comes. Okay? Okay? God, through his prophet, continues to tell his people how they are to respond to the calamity. The drunkards, they're supposed to weep and wail. They are to lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. I mean, can we even imagine the pain and the hurt of a virgin when her husband, her betrothed, the one for whom her heart longs, dies before their wedding? Her anticipated joy is dashed to pieces. She is inconsolable. Continuing with the description of the devastation the locust brings, the house of the Lord isn't even exempt from trouble. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off. What's that mean? It's got a deeper meaning, and the deeper meaning is this, is that without the grain offerings and the drink offerings, the covenantal relationship with the Lord has been cut off. Now, the covenantal relationship with the Lord would have been cut off. I mean, it would have been cut off long before the locusts would have ever swarmed. Okay? Because... The devastations brought by the locust was a result of sin, and sin always breaks relationship. Breaks relationship with people, breaks relationship with God. Israel had a covenantal relationship with God. Their sin broke it. 
And, and certainly it is possible for a nation to go through the motions of their religion, you know, just going through the motions, doing their sacrifices every single day without giving any thought whatsoever to the sin that's in the camp. But when the locust came in this particular situation, and there was no more grain offering, there was no more drink offering, what the locusts were basically doing, or what God was doing through them, was showing them in the physical realm the brokenness that had already happened in the spiritual realm. It had been cut off. So, now the question was, were the people going to face their sin, or would they be further destroyed? Joel continues and gives you an even more complete description of the devastation. Beginning at verse 10, the field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Verse 11, be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered and the pomegranate tree and the palm tree also and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. This is a description of great devastation. Beginning with verse 15, the prophet directs the people from generally weeping, wailing, and lamenting for all that has been lost to go before the Lord to weep and to wail and lament. Go before him to do all of that. See, the trouble came from the Lord. If your troubler is the Lord, you've got to go to the Lord for the answers, right? You've got to, got to take your issues with him because he has issues with you. All right? Verse 13 says, Gird yourself and lament, you priest. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth. You who minister to my God for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off? Before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds shrivel under the clods. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down. For the grain has withered. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. O oh Lord, to you I cry out. For fire has devoured the open pastures. A flame has burned all the trees of the field. Now, it is unknown whether or not these are real fires. Someone has described a swarm of locusts as the sun you know, beats down on their, shines down on their wings, that it does look like a fire coming their way. So, the beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up and the fire has devoured the open pastures. As I've already stated, sin affects everyone and everything. Nothing escapes the consequences brought on by sin. Sure, people think that they can escape sin's consequences, but they can't. It's impossible. Individuals cannot escape sin's consequences. Nations can't escape sin's consequences. You know, it's a terrible thing to realize that most people and most nations do not consider what they do or what their actions will cost them until some kind of terrible devastation comes upon them. And even when terrible devastations come, many people don't recognize that God may be the one bringing the trouble upon them. Again, if God is the bringer of the trouble, God is the solution to the trouble. Would God's people have known to turn to the Lord had he not sent his prophet to them? Well, we don't know because he did send the prophet to them. Now, it is entirely possible that they would have done whatever they could to survive the devastation while, without ever considering that the trouble was from the hand of God. I mean, isn't that what most people do? Isn't that what we do? I mean, we weep and moan, we wail and lament and, uh, you know, for a while and then we move on. 
All right? Isn't that what America did after 9 -1 -1? After Katrina? After Harvey? After Michael? After Irma? After the California fires? And after every single earthquake and tornado? Thank God he did send his prophet to draw the people's attention back to him. Question is, who's drawing, who's calling America back to God? Who is, who is here in America calling for a sacred assembly to be gathered? You know, surely there have been some calls made. You know, Franklin Graham does this, and others as well. But who's listening? I mean, we need to be listening. We need to be responding to the calls to gather and cry out uh, to God for trouble is coming to America and is here. I don't know. I mean, it is not common knowledge, okay? It is not common knowledge because mainstream media poo-poos all this stuff. And the uh, USGS, they don't want it to be known. But you know, back on July 4th and July 5th, you know, there were those two big earthquakes in Ridgecrest, California. Most people don't, don't realize that there have been close to, I don't know how many, but we're closing in on the one million event mark of earthquakes and tremors since that date. A million almost. That's unprecedented. I mean, usually you get a big earthquake and then it subsides. I mean, you get aftershocks and all this, but not hundreds of thousands. Something's going on. But the government officials don't want anybody to know, don't want anybody to be alarmed, so they don't say anything. There are people, of course, who do know and let the information out. But for the most part, most of the message is nothing to see here, just move on. Right. Joel 2, we read, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. What's the point in blowing the trumpet in Zion and sounding the alarm? It's blown to awaken the people to the fact that trouble, that the trouble that's come upon them is from the Lord. It's a wake-up call. Get out of your complacency, people. Okay. The second half of the verse begins, A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Again, people here means locusts. Nations, locusts, 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 locust people, no locusts, okay? The description of the devastation they bring and how they move continues. I mean, this is just more and more devastation. It's just a, a, a great description of what these locusts brought. A fire devours before them and behind them leaves a flame. Behind them a flame burns. Listen to this. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate waste. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. I mean, if, if you could have seen all those faces of all those locusts on the video, their faces do kind of look like horses. Okay? They, and like swift city steeds, so they run. With the noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap. Like the noise of the flaming fire that devours the stubble. There was nothing quiet about all that chewing they were doing. Like a strong people set in battle array. Before them the people ride in pain. All faces are drained of color. Why would the people ride in pain? Why would their faces be drained of color? You know, when they see the vast army of locusts heading their way, because you see, you see a vast army of locusts coming your way, you know what's coming. I mean, in recent years, there have been some locust swarms in the Middle East and in Egypt, uh, a couple places like that, and, and, and the reporters were like going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. These terrible swarms of locusts. 
in the days prior to insecticides, they could not do anything about it. Now, they immediately act to eradicate them. Let's get back to the description. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. I mean, did you see the video? They just, you know, just move and move and move and move and move. Okay? They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb in the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The, the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. The, the, the stars diminish their brightness because they just fill the skies. And it darkens the skies. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is great. Strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? I mean, remember the video we watched? We were watching a video of one of God's armies. He doesn't have necessarily conventional armies. <laughs> he uses his creation. Now, please know, that not every locust swarm is a judgment from God. I mean, locusts do what locusts do. Okay? The one we hear about in Joel, it's from the Lord. It is judgment. And we know it because the context tells us that it is. The point to be made is this, is that if something like this kind of devastation comes, you go to the Lord and you ask him, is this trouble from you? Is this judgment for sin? If it is, what is it? Can we, how can we you know, repent and turn from it? What would you have us do? If it is not from the Lord, of course, we just move on and we recover as best as possible. But if we don't ask the Lord, we run the risk of continuing in whatever sin we may be in the middle of and whatever rebellion brought the trouble on in the first place. And that is never a good place for us to be. So next week, we're going to continue our study of Joel in order to see what becomes of these people upon whom God brought such terrible trouble. Amen.